What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts. This is my weekly uh, soliloquy, solo soliloquizing about a topic that I find interesting or that you find interesting. Having just returned to Costa Rica from Austin, I thought I would talk about skin, skin cancer, sunscreen, and connect it with linoleic acid, like so many things in this video. This one gets me really excited. This is a really interesting rabbit hole to go down. So come along on this journey with me. When I was recently in Austin, I was at Barton Springs a lot. That's my favorite place in Austin because of the water and because of the sun. And there were people spraying sunscreen on every freaking where. It was very difficult to sit anywhere and not breathe in other people's sunscreen. And I really wanted to get up and shake people and say, do you know what is in your sunscreen? Because most people do not know what is in their sunscreen. So I will get to that. I will talk about what is in mainstream, uh, mainstream sunscreens in a moment. But first, I want to start with sunlight and our evolutionary connections with sunlight. Many of you know that I was in Africa earlier this year, spending time with the Hadza. We got to see some Maasai and some Batoga. And there are good studies to show that the Hadza, some of the last remaining hunter-gatherers on the planet, as well as the Maasai, both which uh, groups evolved in equatorial Africa and Tanzania, the Lake Iasi region, end up with vitamin D levels, that is uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels in the blood of around 45 to 50. So we can say that that's probably a normal level for humans. Now, they also did evolve more dark skin for that sun protection, but those of us that are more fair skin can also deposit melanin in our skin when we are exposed to more sun as a uh, fluctuating adaptation. I am quite tan right now. And when I was in Austin, many of my friends commented that I was very tan. This is because I spend most of my time now at the equator or more specifically at the ninth latitude in uh, on the Guanacaste Peninsula of Costa Rica, uh, a blue zone uh, actually, which is kind of a funny coincidence. So my skin has darkened and means now that I can be out in the sun for hours and hours in the morning or even midday surfing and not get burned. Now, there are a lot of things that go into this and we'll talk about most of them in this video, but I think it's important to point out first and foremost that humans evolved outdoors. No big surprise there. We evolved in the sun. Now, like I said, our ancestors did have darker skin than many of us listening to this, or some of listening to this may be blessed with dark skin with lots of melanin, and you have sort of built-in sun protection uh, if you have equatorial ancestors. Now, one thing that often gets left out of the conversation with regard to sun and tanning is benefits of sunlight beyond vitamin D. The mainstream medical establishment wants you to believe that you can substitute all of the benefits of sunlight in a vitamin D pill. And that will mean that your skin will stay young and healthy, you won't get wrinkles, and you won't look like a weathered piece of leather later in your life, except that's a completely false bullshit narrative. Um, because you can't replace everything beneficial from the sun with simply a vitamin D pill, which is usually cholecalciferol, a per precursor to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So what do we get in the sun that's not in a vitamin D pill. Well, many, many things, in fact. I will share my screen for those who are watching this video. Um, this is a very interesting paper looking at the importance of sunlight in basically human health. The title is Sunlight and Vitamin D Necessary for Public Health. And if you read this paper, you will find first that they do talk about the Hadza and the Maasai. They quote their 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels. And then they go on to say that physiologic responses go beyond the production of vitamin D. When the skin is stimulated with UVA radiation, nitric oxide is released. If you listen to the previous podcast I have with Malcolm Kendrick, you know about the importance of nitric oxide, its connections with statins, and basically endothelial health in blood vessels. Basic uh, biology would suggest that you want nitric oxide, you want endothelial cells, which are healthy, and the lack of nitric oxide or the uh, replenishment of nitric oxide, which appears to be a pleiotropic effect, pleiotropic effect of statins, is connected with improved cardiac outcomes. As the paper goes on to say, nitric oxide stimulates vasodilatation and lowering of blood pressure during active UVA exposure that is in the real sunlight, not with a vitamin D pill. Diastolic blood pressure in one study fell by roughly five millimeters of mercury and remained lower for 30 minutes after exposure. A reduction of diastolic blood pressure by five millimeters of mercury decreases the risk for stroke by 34% and coronary heart disease by 21%. Obviously, those are observational correlations, but 
there's a good benefit to having a decreased diastolic blood pressure. Another physiologic response, I'm quoting from the article, of skin exposure to sunlight is thickening of the stratum corneum, the outermost layer of the epidermis, and increased skin pigmentation through production of melanin. As I suggested, this pair of response actually protects the skin and deeper tissues from the deeper penetrating and damaging UVAs while retaining benefits of UVB exposure. Though both UVA and UVB exposure result in increased skin pigmentation, the mechanisms are different, with UVB being responsible for the upregulation of melanin synthesis and thus the protective effects against UV damage to DNA. The best time for creating this response coincides with a time of maximal UVB availability, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. That is in the middle of the day. <laughs> That's when you want to get the UVB response. But here's an important point. Your skin responds to UVA and UVB, thickening the stratum corneum, putting melanin, and protecting DNA from damage. This is an evolutionary response that happens normally. Additionally, according to the paper again, human skin produces beta endorphin in response to UVB exposure. These opioid peptides have been shown to result in a feeling of well-being. That's why the sun feels so good, because you are evolutionarily adapted to be in the sun, boosting the immune system. Oh, lest we forget that we have an immune system today, uh, not uh, withstanding all the controversial topics, relieving pain, promoting relaxation, wound healing, and cellular differentiation. Light signals received through the eye regulate production of melatonin and serotonin for circadian rhythm control and also play a role in seasonal affective disorder. Uh, if you need more information about this, please read this paper. But let's just say it's very clear there are many, myriad even, benefits to sunlight exposure beyond vitamin D. But Paul, sunlight causes cancer. Everyone knows this. It's horrible for you. One of the problems I have with Western medicine is that Western medicine doesn't really understand first principles. Western medicine doesn't really understand connecting dots, thinking outside the box. I've asked this question with regard to LDL in previous videos and in my book, The Carnivore Code, and all of the work I do. I ask, why would something like low-density lipoprotein that carries important hormonal precursors, specifically the cholesterol backbone, or cellular building blocks, triglycerides, phospholipids, all of these important things, and can carry um, other things in it, and plays a role in the immune response, be killing you. Is it possible we have this paradigm incomplete or wrong with regard to LDL? So I would offer the same thought experiment or challenge to the mainstream hypothesis with regard to sun exposure. Why would sun exposure in and of itself, which is so beneficial in so many ways, also be killing us with regard to skin cancers. Is it possible that LDL, low density lipoprotein, and skin cancer related to sunlight or sunlight in general are both similar illustrations of a community effect or a milieu effect? And by this, I mean, is it possible there's another variable that we are missing? If you've heard me talk about low density lipoprotein, you know that I believe there is a third variable, quote unquote, that is a hidden variable. That is metabolic dysfunction. In the case of low density lipoprotein, I strongly believe it is not low density lipoprotein that directly leads to atherosclerosis, that is hardening of arteries, quote unquote, and eventually heart disease, atheroma, uh, stroke, et cetera, that the LDL molecule may be involved in this, but the initiating factor is metabolic dysfunction through a variety of cascades, which are beyond the scope of this video specifically. And I will similarly state I will similarly postulate, hypothesize in this video that I do not believe sunlight directly causes cancer, that there is a hidden third variable that is causing a problem. Can you guess what it is? Might it also be related to metabolic dysfunction? Absolutely. Isn't it interesting how all of this works out together? And when we step outside of what is evolutionarily consistent for humans, we see a range of diseases that are all misinterpreted by Western medicine, but all perhaps have similar causes that being evolutionarily inconsistent behaviors. In this case, I'm referring to food consumption by humans in an evolutionarily inconsistent pattern. What pattern am I thinking of? Excess linoleic acid leading to metabolic dysfunction. If you have questions about that, I would refer you to my recent podcast with Tucker Goodrich, in which we really tried to put to bed, to end, to put the final nail in the coffin in the debate regarding linoleic acid. I've done lots and lots of videos on that as well in the past. All of that notwithstanding, the take home message here is, as I said, I do not believe that sun exposure is the main culprit of skin cancers. I believe it is an evolutionarily inconsistent behavior of humans, in this case, perhaps excess linoleic acid consumption, which may be ending up in skin cells, leading to increased rates of cancer when humans are exposed to the sun. And 
From this, we may derive another possibility, which is if we eat in an evolutionarily consistent manner as humans, maybe we can be in the sun and not get burned and not develop skin cancers like so many of those who are metabolically unhealthy. Eating a standard American diet overly rich in linoleic acid may suffer. This is why I do the work that I do and hope that it will change lives positively. Hopefully it will get you in the sun and been experiencing all those benefits I talked about and another one, which I'll show you in a moment and not fearing the sun if you change the way you are living and eating in general. This is super important. If you need more convincing that sunlight is beneficial for you and that any paradigm that suggests that sunlight is bad for you may be incomplete, consider this article. Skin exposure to narrow band ultraviolet light, which is UVB, modulates the human intestinal microbiome. This is a small study, but it's an interventional study, okay? They took um, 21 females and gave one group vitamin D supplements and one group they exposed to three narrow band UV light exposures within the same week. And the serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels of participants in both groups increased on average 7.3 nanomole per liter, right? But only in the group exposed to three narrow band UV light exposures, it wasn't even full sunlight. There was increased alpha and beta diversity of the gut microbiome. How incredible is that? They shifted the gut microbiome of humans with ultraviolet light on the skin. This is the first study to show that humans with have low 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels display overt changes in their intestinal microbiome in response to narrow band UVB skin exposure and increases in, tw in 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, uh, suggesting the existence of a novel skin gut axis. Okay, do you still believe that the mainstream dermatologic narrative that sun is bad for you is complete. No, there must be a third variable. We are missing something. We are missing something because we know sunlight is the key to so many things. And dare I suggest this next study without getting censored. Hopefully the Instagram bots will be kind to me. I suggest for your consideration, this study, which is quite old. We've known about this for a very long time. Evidence that vitamin D supplementation could reduce the risk of influenza and COVID-19 infections and death. We've been talking about vitamin D levels and COVID forever. What about the possibility that there are all of these other things that happen? Uh, immune system improved with these uh, endogenous beta endorphins from real sunlight? Hmm. But we were telling people to stay locked indoors. Imagine that. Okay. So now that you know the benefits of sunlight and my overarching hypothesis, let's consider a few more things. Let's look at this important piece of information regarding sunscreens. Because let's face it, many of us, if we have not been exposed to the sun gradually and consistently because we don't have outdoor jobs or outdoor uh, work, um, then we may need some sunscreen temporarily while our body adjusts. When I first came to Costa Rica, I had to wear a shirt while I was surfing or I would have gotten burned pretty badly. But over time, my body adjusted and I don't need it anymore. So there are a couple of phases of this response. But if you'll hear, even when I had Tucker Goodrich on the show, who is uh, red-haired and fair-skinned, after repeated sun exposures, he's been able to tolerate quite a bit more sunlight. I had a friend here in Costa Rica who was also from the United Kingdom, was quite fair-skinned, and goodness gracious, he got very, very dark. So I don't think that your ancestry or your genetics really limit this unless you have a genetic defect in the production of melanin. If you can produce melanin, I believe that gradual, consistent sun exposure will get you to a point where your skin is protected. But along the way, you may need to use sunscreen or cover up to avoid burns. And how are you going to do that? Well, don't use mainstream sunscreen. That's the first thing I want to drive home. If you have any questions about this, I would recommend to you very strongly that you check out the Environmental Working Group and their data on the compounds in sunscreens, which are extremely harmful for humans. I will also point you to a recent paper done by the FDA, of all people, um, looking at systemic absorption of sunscreen components, avobenzone, oxybenzone, and others, which are not good, pretty clearly hormonal disruptors. So the systemic absorption of sunscreen active ingredients support the need for further studies to determine clinical significance of these findings. If you spray sunscreen on your body, you are absorbing endocrine disruptors. End of story. Do not use mainstream sunscreens. Do not have a benzone, oxybenzone, octocrylene, ecamsol. There are many others. Do not use these. Read this article on the EWG, the trouble with ingredients in sunscreens. They go through all of these. 
specifically citing oxybenzone, homosalate, and octocrylene with uh, recommendations from the European Commission, Commission, which recommended much lower levels than, uh, than compounds, than much lower levels of these compounds than are found in many sunscreens in the United States. Imagine that. These are really problematic, guys. Here's a chart, hormone disruption. All of them disrupt hormones. Some of these have not been proven. Octocrylene, they say no. Octosalate, they say no, but homosalate, octibenzone, avobenzone, yes. What's perhaps less bad? Zinc oxide, perhaps titanium dioxide. So on the EWG, they also have a listing of the best recreational sunscreens, which meets their criteria. Here's what I would do. If I were going to make a sunscreen, perhaps this is something I will try and create in the future if people would like this, I would make tallow-based sunscreen. I would also not put seed oils on your skin, and I would combine tallow with something like beeswax and maybe something like zinc oxide. That would make a good sunscreen. You could also cover up and be exposed to morning and evening sunlight that isn't as intense until your skin is ready to accept the sun. But realize that sun is very, very beneficial for you. Now, bringing it full circle, there are so many anecdotes out there now, guys. And again, this is anecdotal, this is observational, but hopefully we will uh, be able to fund research like this in the future. Many of you may have heard I'm creating a nonprofit to do research into animal-based nutrition. This will be one of the things we want to fund, which will be studies looking at linoleic acid levels and propensity for burning and perhaps even precancerous lesions of the skin. But as I mentioned, refer to Tucker Goodrich's work and even look at his blog here where he has a whole post on omega-6 and sunburn, that is linoleic acid and sunburn. When I post about this on Instagram or Twitter, I get so many comments. There are so many N equals one now that it N equals many. <laughs> there are so many examples of people who come out of the woodwork to say, you know what? I cut seed oils out of my diet and I burn so much less. I tan so much more easily. This is enough to generate a very strong hypothesis that makes me very curious, very curious about what is going on here with linoleic acid and cancers of the skin and burning of the skin. Those are absolutely connected. So the question that I begin to ask is, what kind of evidence do we have that linoleic acid might actually be linked to cancers? Well, there's a growing amount of this. And one of these articles that I pulled up for this presentation was this one, dietary fats high in linoleic acid impair anti-tumor T cell responses by inducing EFAB, EFAPB, mediated mitochondrial dysfunction. This is actually done in a mouse model, a murine model, but Diets high in linoleic acid do clearly induce more cancers in these models. Is it possible this is doing this in humans as well? I would say yes. And there are interventional studies in the past that I have talked about with Tucker Goodrich in which there was a cancer signal that is concerning. Why would it not also apply to skin cancers? So the overarching point of this video is to tell you the sun is good for you. Do not fear the sun. If you got my email today uh, in the newsletter, you heard me talk about this as well. And if you didn't get my email today, go to hardensoil.co and sign up for my censorship-free newsletter. I talk about all kinds of controversial things in it that you will benefit from, and I think it would really be worth your time. Now, the takeaway, as I said, is this. Treasure the sun on as much of your body as you can get. Don't get burned and realize that gradually you can accumulate what some might call a solar callus. You can accumulate melanin, thickening of the stratum corneum, and you can get all those other benefits immune benefits, microbiome benefits, mood benefits, nitric oxide benefits that do not happen with a vitamin D supplement. Many of you may be asking, I live in Northern Climes and we're going into the winter. What should I do? I don't have any affiliation with this brand, but you might consider something like a Sparity lamp or even tanning. The study that I showed with the microbiome used narrow band UV light. They're using a synthetic light. I think these are beneficial. And it's something that I have done when I lived in Seattle, which is a very dreary place that I choose not to live anymore. I much prefer the ninth latitude. So the sun is beneficial. Why would something that is beneficial also be bad for us? We need to think about these things. Does the dose make the poison? Well, the dose definitely makes more of the poison when you are swimming in a seed oil rich standard American diet. Eat an evolutionarily consistent diet and see how your life changes in so many amazing ways. As you all know, a huge part of an evolutionarily consistent diet, in my opinion, is animal organs. I love them. I include them in my diet all the time. If you can't get fresh organs, check us out at heartandsoil.co. I'll read you guys a review that I recently got from one of our supplements, which I think is amazing. I'm really proud to do this work. This is from Hunter C. And the title is life-changing. He said, my wife and I struggle with infertility. He uses whole package 
Last month, my semen analysis count was almost zero. I've been taking heart and soil for the past month. And just recently, my test went up a massive, massive amount. The supplements, along with exercise and a healthy animal-based diet, have truly made a difference. Thank you so much. I get results. I get reviews like this all the time from people whose fertility improves, all kinds of improvements from organs, guys. So if you can't get fresh organs or you want certain organs that you can't get in general, check us out, heartandsoil.co. This is how you reclaim your birthright to radical health. Getting in the sun, preferably on the more of your body is better, is also how you reclaim your birthright to radical health. I love you all. Thanks for watching this one. Please share it if you know someone who would benefit.